Her husband sang of his daughter, the Princess Margaret. The words were as acid in a wound. Me seemeth, said he, that in all the north country there is no lady so fair, nor none so good as this most beautiful princess. Proudly the queen drew herself up, and from under drooped eyelids with the look of a hawk as it swoops for its prey, she made answer to the lord from the south. I am the queen, she said. Ye might have accepted me. Then turning swift like a texel that strikes its quarry, she said to the princess, A ladly worm shalt thou be crawling amongst the rocks. A ladly worm shalt thou stay until thy brother wind comes home again. So impossible seemed such a threat to the princess that her red lips parted over her white teeth and she laughed long and merrily. But those who knew that the new queen had studied long all manner of wicked spells and cruel magic were filled with dread, for greatly they feared that the fair princess's joyous days were done. The foreign islands were purple-black in a chill gray sea, and the waves that beat on the rocks beneath the castle seemed to have a more dolorous moan than common when next evening came. The joyous princess, jingling her big bunch of keys and smiling a welcome to her father's guests, had gone as completely as though she lay buried beside the drowned mariners for whom the silting sand under the waves makes a safe graveyard all along that bleak and rugged coast. But a horror, a crawling, shapeless, loathsome thing, writhed itself along the pathway from cliff to village and sent the terror-stricken peasants shrieking into their huts and battering at the castle gates for sanctuary. The old ballad tells us that for seven miles east and seven miles west and seven miles north and south, no blade of grass or corn could grow, so venomous was her mouth. Like an embodied plague, the bewitched princess preyed on the people of her father's kingdom, who daily brought to the cave where she coiled herself up at night to sleep, a terrified tribute of the milk of seven cows. All over the north country spread the dread of her name, but now she was no longer the lovely Princess Margaret, but the ladly worm of Spindleston Hugh. Word went east and word went west, and word is gone over the sea, that a ladly worm in Spindleston Hughes would ruin the north country. Far over the sea, with his thirty-three bold men-at-arms, the princess's brother, Child Wind, was carving a career for himself with his sword. Nothing on earth did Child Wind fear, yet ever and again, when success in battle had been his, he would have a heavy heart, dreading he knew not what, and often he longed to see again the castle on the high rock by the sea, and the fair little sister with whom so many happy days had been spent amongst the blue grass and on the yellow sand of the dunes at Bambro. To his camp came rumor of the strange monster that was devastating his father's lands, and down to the coast he hastened with his men, a great homesickness dragging at his heart, homesickness and a terror that all was not well with Margaret. Some rough, brown-faced mariners, whose boat had not long before nearly suffered wreck on the rocks of the Northumbrian coast, were able to tell the prince that rumor spoke truth, and that a ladly worm was laying waste his father's kingdom. Of the princess they could give no tidings, 
But the prince needed no words from them to tell him that all was not well. We have no time here to waste. Hence quickly let us sail. My only sister Margaret, something I fear doth ail.